So, I'm sure that you guys can see from the title of the video what it's going to be generally about. So, I want to preface the beginning of this video by saying that this is an attempt at being as objective as possible um, to the subject <laughs> of cancel culture and its effects right now. Um, but before I actually start to talk about it, I want to talk about why I decided to do an episode about this subject. Um, specifically within music is how I'm going to, you know, approach this conversation at first. Um, and then I, I might talk about some things um, about cancel culture within society in general, but it's going to mainly be about um, music. So, first let me just say what inspired me to, to, to finally do something like this. Um, it really has to do with the continuance of seeing a lot of things in my local music scene recently about bands getting canceled and um you know some some stories that are now coming out about people that uh i've honestly never met I, i've never met the majority of these people in the dfw music scene that are actively going through this as far as being canceled goes um, or, you know, coming forward, the victims coming forward with their stories and things like that. So, um, that's what's been going on, at least, uh, that, that finally made me pull the trigger in, in doing a video like this. And, um... If you experienced something, I, I want to first just apologize that, you know, you, you went through something like that and it probably doesn't help that some guy you're probably not familiar with is talking about this sort of thing, but I think it's something that needs to be addressed now. Um, and I'd like to also share some of my personal experiences with people that I've known that have been canceled. And then I'm going to share um, a more personal experience myself kind of later on. So the uh, first thing I want to say about the, the concept of canceling in general is that it's not anything new, okay? This is something that has always existed in multiple different forms. Um, the internet and access to social media has really just accelerated this phenomenon. Uh, I don't think that the act of somebody being canceled is something that is honestly very unique I don't think that that's, I don't think it's a unique phenomenon. I think that maybe the, some of the ways in which that it's affecting people is unique. And I do think that there are certain aspects of maybe some of the, the, uh, some, some of the, reprehensible behavior that is being called upon as being cancel worthy is unique 
and it's a very it's a very small set of circumstances that I think fall under that category specifically but let's talk about the history of music briefly so the majority of musicians throughout history are actually unrecorded okay that let's just get that out of the way um throughout history music recording you know a musician recording their song um really only happened whenever music could be written down first you know we're talking um we're, we're talking you know like early ad period basically um and if you really want to go back to like ancient civilizations i mean you can go back that far um into the you know 2000 3000 bc era where we have some markings that we believe to be you know um music being written down and then we have other documents that are more definitively music being written down but you know it's in a format that's like not easily understood unless you're um uh, you know, well versed in this particular culture's uh, language and how they write and things like that. So, we're just gonna bypass most of that history because I don't think it's very relevant, obviously. Uh, but whenever we get to what we consider to be modern music, and this is just historically correct and factual and I don't really care if people don't agree with me but um, what we know of as modern music originates from African American slaves and it's a it was a form of vocal singing at like it's like bare minimum method of song and what they're called is field haulers okay and this was something that started to be documented in people's diaries that could read and write um, often from plantation owners themselves or some of the family members of plantation owners that, that lived on the, the plantation. Um, and what they describe it as is essentially a, an a cappella song of sorrow. And it usually was something that occurred after a family member was either beaten to death or sold or was, um, you know, or a friend or, a, or you know, a, a lover being taken away because slaves obviously couldn't get married. And so there were often times where the slave owner would... Uh, have you know have intimacy with someone's wife or girlfriend and um and that and th these songs spurred out of those moments literally on the plantation field which is why they're called field haulers and Whenever instruments became more regularly available to slaves, um, they started to 
essentially, you know, play a lot of these field haulers with instruments. Um, usually it was someone else that could play, you know, the guitar. And then uh, somebody else would be singing. And these things usually would occur on, like, off days or something. Because uh, slaves had usually, like, one day of uh, of rest, um, usually on Sunday. And it's because the uh, slave owners would force them to go to church or involve themselves in some kind of religion um, that would reinforce their slavery ideology, essentially. Uh, But through that form of music, it became what we know as the blues, okay? That's where blues music originates from. Um, and so the majority of blues music was not ever recorded because there was nobody to write down this music. There was nobody that, uh, would even think about recording this kind of music because a lot of people due to racism didn't even see it as music. And that's just how it was. Um, Now, we're going to skip ahead a little bit to Robert Johnson. All right, so Robert Johnson recorded his album in San Antonio, Texas. Um... I believe it was like 1918. Um, maybe 19. It was either 1918 or 1916. Something like that. Um, it was before the Great Migration. Uh, maybe even in the early stages of the Great Migration. And Robert Johnson was, at the time, um, considered to be the best guitar player. And it scared people so much that uh, there were all kinds of stories made up about him. Some people said he made a deal with the devil. Some people said that he, uh, you know, would go and um, worship the devil. And and then other people would say he would, uh, he was, you know, on all kinds of uh, crazy voodoo spells and things like that. There were, there were a lot of rumors about him, but... The truth was is that uh, he was uh, essentially a runaway slave who just refused to live under slavery. And in the sharecropping era, um, it was kind of known that sharecropping was an extension of slavery even though this the civil war had ended slavery years prior to that and so he just refused to participate in the entire function of it and was reprimanded uh reprimanded several times by slaves so much so that um There were several accounts of people close to him that literally told him he was going to get himself killed uh, because of how defiant he was. And he went on the run pretty much as soon as he was able to as a teenager. And um, he became a drunk. And the only 
the only thing he would really be able to do for money was to hang out at these underground bars essentially that would pop up usually in like a barn somewhere or um you know somebody's you know extended house or something on the land in which they were sharecroppers and um he he would just kind of show up and uh and and play and would get paid in alcohol and food really um but he would go on to eventually record this album and it wasn't until it was played at a theater in France that the music genre had any sort of recognition and uh, of course from then on people started writing about Robert Johnson and then everybody discovered all the myths about Robert Johnson but at this point um, he had been dead for quite a while and the Great Migration had been sort of in full effect at that point for I think it was like 10 years or something and so blues music had started to be written down um, in Chicago, uh, formulated very closely with the uh, NAACP formation. And um, that's essentially where modern music comes from. Now, if you were to try to tag this concept of canceling somebody um i think you would have to kind of acknowledge that uh robert johnson was probably the first canceled musician that you could really pinpoint i mean he was at one point literally um kicked out of every social circle that he ever associated himself with after freeing himself from the sharecropping um, way of living, essentially. And it mainly had to do with the fact that uh, he he would kind of do this thing where he'd go and meet a bunch of people and play a couple of nights at this underground bar and whenever enough people would show up he would get into trouble and he would get into fights and he would uh you know sleep with women and and he would um steal because he didn't have any money he didn't have anything and you know he he uh got into a lot of trouble and so i think it's fair to say that if we were to take this concept of canceling and apply it across, you know, any historical context, he could be considered to be, you know, the first quote-unquote canceled musician of modern music. Now, we're going to move past that even further now and get into a lot of the more relatable ideas of of cancel cancellation within music. So there's been tons of bands and musicians that have done things over time within their music that has alienated them from their audience on a consistent basis. Um, the most notable example past you know Robert Johnson would probably have to be Elvis um Elvis was banned from playing so many different places because they thought his music and his dancing was just too provocative so Elvis is a canceled musician under what we understand canceling to be about 
and he he was 100% um, a part of the rebellious culture that was anti-establishment, that was anti- uh, It was just anti-normal, really. It was just like everything that he was doing was completely opposite of what every religious leader was telling the majority of the people in a community what they should be living by. Um, It was everything against what mayors and uh, city officials believed and would allow in their city so he was banned from certain cities and um certain areas within the country purely because of you know his music and it had nothing to do with you know what he had done at that point um and there's a lot to be said about what elvis ended up doing with throughout his career but that would be the next big notable example in history. And from here, you can see a trend of, you know, the Beatles. Uh, the Beatles were not very accepted by a lot of people. Um, now, they were a little bit more accepted than Elvis was whenever Elvis became a phenomenon, essentially. Um, but it wasn't necessarily... Like, the Beatles came along and everybody just loved the Beatles. No, I mean, it was a generational thing, a very clear generational thing where the younger generation idolized the Beatles and the older generation despised the Beatles. So you kind of start to see a clear pattern here. But now I want to talk about where... the music culture went in the 60s with Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix and Bob Dylan and how that led into the 70s um, with you know, Fleetwood Mac and women breaking barriers within music, Janis Joplin, um, you know, from the 60s and inspiring more female musicians throughout the 70s. Um, and uh, um, Karen Carpenter, uh, you know, d- the the list starts to go on and on of musicians that were initially not accepted in their genre, in their region, and were quote-unquote canceled, banned, whatever you want to call it. And then we get into the 80s, where punk music becomes something that gets even more aggressive than the Sex Pistols from the 70s, that were also, you know, very counterculture and was not accepted by society and you know all the implications of those things led bands to do more aggressive things musically in the 80s and then by the time we get to the 90s it's you know it it's more accepted in a in a way that I don't think had ever really been um, really recognized until really generations after the 90s and I don't, I think that, you know, there was still a lot of dissenters to bands, you know, in the 90s for multiple reasons. I mean, I know that suicidal tendencies um, in the 90s were 
essentially banned and canceled from everywhere. Um, and I know that even though Nirvana was huge, that there was, you know, a subculture of older generations that didn't agree with his messaging, um, or the band's messaging, and things like that. But overall, society had become a lot more tolerant by then. And, and that's very clear whenever you compare, um, previous generations of music, musicians like, uh, the Beatles and, um, Elvis and Robert Johnson, which is just blues music. So, in the 80s, with bands like White Snake and Motley Crue, I think there's something to really take a note of here, which is the the fashion and the messaging of a lot of these bands. It's primarily just party based and there's an expectation or a um, an acknowledgement I guess is a better word that all of these bands are obviously based off of their lyrics and their image um, consumed with sexuality I mean, you had bands like uh, Guns N' Roses and um, you had bands like Judas Priest and uh, and White Snake and Warrant and like all these. Uh, Twisted Sister, and like you had all these bands that were very <laughs> clearly making a statement with their image and in their music about you know what they're about. And here's where I think it the the concept of canceling in a modern sense really becomes important because. With all of these bands, with Aerosmith and all of those kinds of bands, we we all know what they participated in. And people knew what they were participating in whenever they made that music. Okay, that's why it was popular. Um, and all of the, the, the lyrical content confirms any of those suspicions for people. Now, that's not to say that they didn't have some songs of substance, or they didn't have some songs that actually um, had nothing to do with, you know, sexuality or partying or anything like that. Um, but that was the overall messaging, and that's what was popular, and that's what people gravitated toward, and, and it's it was exciting music, and arguably, it's still very exciting music to listen to. So, there's nothing necessarily inherently bad with that, it, it was, it's just that's what it was, right? But, here's something that... I've noticed, and I've had this conversation with a few friends of mine, right, where if you look at music today, and really going back to like the early 2000s, and you look at some of the bands that had a lot of allegations against them, and a lot of really negative things about their encounters with minors um, on on a, a scale that is talked about as if it's, you know, so unbelievable that they could even be in those situations with minors or with these vulnerable women, right? 
Well, if you look at those bands and you look at the lyrical content of their songs, okay, and you look at the imaging, I don't really see why, and I've never thought why, um, I've never, I've never seen why, I've never thought about why so many people would be shocked by that. And it's purely because it just seems so obvious to me. Um, I mean, the entire image aspect is the same feminine imaging that you saw bands doing in the 80s that, you know, they all talked about partying and sleeping with a bunch of women, and that's what it was to them, right? The only thing that I see that's different about some of these emo bands that were accused of these, you know, and, and, and turned out to be true, you know, a lot of these instances with minors and things like that, um, they mirrored a lot of those same images of bands from the 80s that were hair metal bands i mean and this is something this is something that's not completely lost on people because um it's something that people have been talking about for almost 20 years now i i remember being a kid in like the early 2000s and uh and being in middle school and you know i had friends of mine that were dyeing their hair that were straightening their hair and I, you know, I heard my parents and other, uh, my friends' parents and, like, people say all the time, oh, the 80s are back. Uh, like, that's very clear, you know? Like, people are dyeing their hair crazy colors. People are, you know, um, you know, guys are wearing fingernail polish and, um, you know, guys are wearing mascara and teasing their hair and straightening their hair and, like, that's like that's all stuff that was done in the eighties, and uh, what was the culture about? Like, let's just put it bluntly, right? What was the culture about? It was about partying. It was about women. I mean, there's literally songs written by some of these bands in the eighties talking about underage women. So. Um, I've never been surprised. Now, this genre of, you know, emo music, um, it's never appealed to me. I've never liked it. I, people don't believe me sometimes whenever I say I've never went through a scene phase, but, like, I've shown people pictures from whenever I was in middle school and whenever I was in elementary school and... I've never been through a scene phase. I've sort of always, you know, been like the skater kid that was into Tony Hawk Pro Skater and, um, you know, listening to Green Day and No FX and like, that's just, I've always been that way. And I mean, I'm 30 now. And, uh, not much has changed. Like, if I'm being honest, and this might not be something to brag about, but I haven't really dressed all that different, <laughs> like, since I was that age. Um, I, <laughs> and it's mainly just because, like, you know what? I like what I like, all right? Like, I like wearing, you know, a plain t-shirt with a pocket in it and just some jeans, like, and I don't know. This is that's always been sort of my style. It's always been the kind of music I was in, I was interested in. But here's something that I don't think enough people talk about, right? So all these emo bands, <laughs> they all sing about generally the same kinds of things. It's always mental health. So. That's one, all right? Mental health. So they all sing about mental health, all right? 
And then what else do they all sing about? Okay, relationships. Right. Huh. Mental health and relationships. What else do they sing about? Um, usually self-harm. Okay, so kind of ties in with mental health. Not really a positive thing. Um, not really anything that's super thought-provoking, right? Um, just kind of is what it is. And then, let's see, what else do they normally sing about? Um, usually some kind of social strife. People cheating on each other. People not having money. Something that's, you know, like, very imbalanced in society. Um, A lot of those bands will even flat out talk about... What is this? What is... What... Where did this little piggy go? Huh? Can anybody tell me? Sexual assault. They sing about those things, too, sometimes, right? And... I was having a conversation with a friend of mine, um, another musician friend, and I just thought to myself... Like, why are we still so surprised that it's these kinds of bands that sing about all these same things that dress emulating a lot of these 80s bands that was all about partying and women? Like, it seems like what's happened is that the culture really hasn't changed that much except for maybe the mental health aspect instead of partying being glorified. Um, I mean, I don't really see much of a difference between modern emo music and hair metal. And I never really have... I just, I mean, you look at what these bands are doing, and it's metal guitars, okay? A lot of this stuff is metal influence, so it's kind of like they're telling on themselves that, hey, this is the kind of music that we're pulling our entire persona from, right? Um, but the bands themselves don't see it that way because, oh, no, 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 my, the bands I'm into are, they're so much cooler than... Motley Crue, those guys were fucking bigots and fascists and, you know, like, they're doing that thing. But that's not, that's not accurate because, like, that's, where did you get those things from, really? Like, if you were to try, like, if you were to try to take the anthropology of the progression of this particular genre of music, it's just kind of a no-brainer to me. So... That's what I've seen for a very long time. And I understand why the genre is popular. Because, think about this. We live in a very desperate society. And when I say desperate society, I mean on multiple levels. We live in a society where people are desperate for attention. People are desperate for validation. People are desperate for acknowledgement. People are desperate for um, their victimhood. People are, are desperate for money. People are desperate for some kind of social connection. And people are desperate in terms of their mental health, their depression that they're dealing with on a daily basis. And whenever you're young, you are depressed, okay? And there's just no other way around that. Um, And unfortunately, our culture enables that depression on multiple fronts. It's really not just one thing. Um, I think we enable it in schools. I think we enable it in social media spaces. I think that we enable it 
in our friends. I'm just being completely blunt here, all right? Uh, I think there's a lot of fr people that are friends with each other that are kind of enabling their own depression. Um, and it's a really unfortunate thing. So whenever a band comes around or I mean even this like weird sad pop music, you know, I mean I've heard some of it. I don't I'm not fond of it. Um but like whenever these kinds of musicians come around, they attract all of the people that are into that kind of music because that's what they're dealing with on their day-to-day -day life all right they're dealing with depression they're dealing with self-harm stuff and we've we've heard this for so long from fans of of different genres that part of the reason why they like this genre or, or they like this musician is because they were saying something that they connected with and felt like they were finally being understood. They were finding comfort in this music because it made them feel like they weren't alone, that they, that they shared something, right? So it's these kinds of bands that have had this perpetual issue. Now, there's been stuff that has come out about other kinds of bands, right? Uh, and we're going to talk about that in a second. But focusing on this in terms of the culture within music, it's primarily coming from these kinds of bands, these these pop punk emo you know metalcore bands that are primarily mental health focused that um, end up having a lot of these allegations and the thing is is that these bands they attract this younger audience because of the lyrical content of their songs because of the imagery okay because the imagery is provocative and it's feminine and it's accepting the the environment is that you know we're all going to share our pain with each other that's the environment and that's a really hard thing to navigate for any musician in general but if you're playing this genre and you're putting yourself in these kinds of spaces and you're dealing with those things for real on top of all of that that's the that's the absolute worst person that you would want to give so much attention to okay um this, this is somebody who is clearly not handling life very well. Um, if they really are dealing with things like self-harm or addiction or um, you know really terrible relationships um this is not someone that you want to be putting in positions around vulnerable people, 
I mean, that just seems like a no-brainer to me, right? But it happens. And people are shocked whenever something comes out about their local emo band um, taking a conversation a little too far um, and doing things with a minor that they shouldn't have been doing, right? Like, that's, that's something that is, it, you can easily draw the connection to, all right? Now, here's something that I've noticed, um, in terms of the act of canceling, okay? The threshold for what is or isn't cancelable is, it's, constantly shifting I don't I can't find a I can't find a consistency between some bands that I have just discovered that were that I'm finding out are canceled and what they were being canceled for and other bands that um I've known about for years that were canceled that I'm very well aware of what they were canceled about like there's there, this the a lot of these stories are not matching up and I've noticed that in this in the cases that they're not matching up it's usually outside of this emo genre it's usually bands that are not emo at all um, that end up being canceled for something that y- you just like scratch your head and you're like what like they were canceled for for that and um i don't know it's uh it's starting to be a little confusing as a music fan <laughs> um so let me let me use an example um I don't remember the name of the band now. It's a it's a solo artist, but I dis I discovered through this article on Reddit um, that there was this guy that was like really popular, and it was just like one comment on this Reddit thread, and it was like, yeah, it sucks. That there's so many musicians getting canceled. I still can't believe the story about whoever this guy was. So I was like, okay, first let me listen to the guy's music because I, I want to know what genre he's even playing. I looked it up and he played this like 70s style disco feel type thing. Like it was R&B, disco, pop. It was pretty good. I mean, um, but it took me like a day, almost an entire day of just periodically going through articles on Google, trying to figure out like, why was this guy fucking canceled? And, uh, come to find out it's because him and a friend of his were... Somebody had taken a picture of them at a Trump rally. And that was it. Um, Now, I dove into this interview with him where he talks about why he was at the Trump rally with this friend. And uh, I I don't remember the exact words in the article that he said but it kind of came out to you know look I've been a liberal my whole life and we're in a very divisive polarized country and I had a friend of mine that didn't agree with me and in order to you know broaden my understanding of the social climate 
I wanted to really see if what was happening at this Trump rally was, you know, what was being reported on the news or if things were actually different. And, you know, this was like 2016, I guess, so 2017. Um, or, I'm sorry, 2015, 2016 is essentially whenever he got canceled or something. And, uh... Or it's, or it's not whenever he got canceled, but that's whenever he was at this Trump rally. And so he just, um, and, and, and so that's what his explanation was. He was like, you know, look, I was young. I, I didn't really know what I believed in. And I just kept seeing stuff on the news. And I ended up at this Trump rally. And, you know, um, I don't, he's, he, he even, I think he even said in the article, he's like, I don't, uh, I didn't vote for Trump or something like that, but just him being seen there in 2015 was, like, enough for him to get canceled. And that's obviously an extreme case, right? But I'm, I'm going to tie it into some of my personal experiences with this because it's, it's starting to really not make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, because rumors have always, throughout history, spread so fast and so easily with absolutely no guardrails, okay? And the internet and social media has just made that phenomenon accelerated to a scary degree, honestly. And, um... I had a group of music friends that ended up being quote unquote canceled during the pandemic and it started out of someone being upset that they weren't invited to a party. Okay, this isn't this isn't a joke. This is actually how it started. Someone wasn't invited to a party. There was a little bit of in in group tension for reasons that weren't ever really explained to me. It was like loosely explained to me. Back then, it was, it was a while ago, but essentially, all kinds of stuff ended up being said about this entire group of friends of mine that wasn't true at all, and I know none of it could have been true, because if any of them were actually doing any of those things, um, in, and they all lived together, and they were in the presence of each other, there's no way any of them would remain friends with each other. Not a chance. Um, and, you know, we're all still friends today. Um, we don't really, we don't live in the same area, but we're all still friends today. And uh, some of the stuff that was said was pretty crazy. Um, there was, you know, there were allegations of full-on rape and sexual assault. And none of that ever happened. Um, but, you know, the, the group never really recovered after that. They weren't able to do the things they wanted to. One of their bands um, wasn't allowed to play. Actually, two of their bands weren't allowed to play anymore. Um, and uh, even though they had, you know, so many people online that came to their defense and said, hey, this is not true. You guys are just saying stuff. You don't know any context. Um, 
and even some of the people that were making, you know, saying these things were people that they had never had any interaction with, like on a personal level. So that's how easily this shit can happen. And it was really sad to be a part of that and in that environment. And someone that we were all friends with, I wasn't as close with them. Um, But in that dark period, ended up killing himself. And, uh, I mean, I went to the funeral, and it was disorienting. Now, that I mean, that's not, I mean, we'll never really know why he decided to do that. Um, and he, he, you know, it's not the first person that I've known to commit suicide. I've known three, four people, four people that have committed suicide since I was in high school. Um, I mean, a a friend of mine that I had that used to say hi to me in high school every day, um, even though I didn't really talk to him all that much, just because I was a little socially awkward. But, um, I mean, he wasn't. I was. I was a little socially awkward. Uh... The year after we graduated, I mean, I literally saw him the day that he killed himself, and I I recognized him. I tried to say hi, and he didn't say hi back. And that was the day, apparently. Um, And so, we'll never really know why anybody decides to make that decision. But that situation showed me that, you know, some there's this weird thing happening in society in general where these people that you think are your friends that have you back, they're, they're, they're not going to be there for you. And, I mean, all of this conversation online, it started over somebody being upset that they weren't invited to a party. And then somebody made a page because, uh, you know, somebody was upset about something, somebody else saw that they were upset about something else, and then they connected online, and then they got together, and they made this page, and then, you know, it just went haywire. And, um, you know, that person, I don't think, I don't think she intended to, uh, lump the entire group into the situation that she was dealing with one person in particular and I don't know the the entire story of what happened between her and this person in particular that she had had a certain experience with but I do know contextually that she had been in an off and on again relationship with this person in this group and there were a lot of mis there was a lot of miscommunication in the relationship and she felt a certain way about a certain thing that happened between them in this gray area of them being in a relationship not being in a relationship kind of thing and that's difficult for anybody to go through and like I said I wasn't there so I don't know exactly what she experienced but it had nothing to do with the four of my friends the three or four of my friends that were implicated in being you know these things that people they had never met were saying about them. So, I say all this to say that since then, I've even seen more 
of that kind of behavior. It's just more of the accusatory behavior online of musicians of a certain demographic. I mean, we can just say it. It's the straight white male demographic that has a lot of these things being said about them, um, whether they're true or, or untrue. Um, and that's just the, this is the fact right now. I mean, that's just, it's part of the ideology that people are living them within. It's the, it's the, it's the adopted mindset that people of a certain race and class are the perpetrators in society even if you know even if there's no evidence that they've done something and now I'm going to share my personal experience as to what happened um in in my case um and this is 100% true and I've kept you know I've kept screenshots of everything that I still show people <laughs> um but Back in 2022, no, actually, yeah, maybe 2022, it could have started in 2021, I can't remember exactly, I'd have to look, but um, our band was playing a show, and I met some people that I'd never met before, they were brand new to Denton, apparently, um, literally just started going to school uh, at UNT and one night at this show I, I I met some of these people that I've never met before I was very respectful I, you know I said hi how are you I talked to the one person in the circle that I knew asked them how they were doing everybody was very quiet um, it was very obvious that you know there was a lot of social anxiety present on both ends because i'm not a very naturally social person um something i've had to work on my entire life and uh i kind of just walked away from the exchange after just getting everybody's names and Asking them how they knew each other and asking them what they were going to school for. And uh, then our band played the show. I had multiple friends that were with me because I never really go out alone. I only ever go out with people that I know. Um, and so we played the show. You know, I talked to the people that I knew there. And packed up my stuff and left and everything was normal I said bye to the owner because I was friends with the owner I knew who he was and then two or three days later there is this Instagram page that pops up out of nowhere and it says that I misgendered somebody it says that I stared at them while we were playing and made them uncomfortable it says that I was standing too close to them whenever I was watching the other bands play um, and then one of the instances referenced a time that I was out with another group of friends and said that I was dancing too close to them. And uh, that went out on this Instagram page that had all these other terrible allegations about guys that had apparently like beat their girlfriends and uh, took advantage of girls at a party and like all this other stuff. But... And the post that was made about me literally admits that I was never talking 
to some of the people that I was, you know, supposedly staring at and making them uncomfortable. Um, and I, you know, it admits that I, I didn't touch anybody. I didn't, um, I didn't, uh, cross any vocalized boundaries. Um, in, I ended up doing some digging and I figured out who the person was that made this post and it was just this person that I had just met that one time in that circle of friends that I had no prior knowledge of before, you know, they were new to Denton, um, and I, I immediately, after I discovered this post, uh, took screenshots and I sent it to every band and, um, booking agent that I've ever worked with and been close with and showed them and was completely upfront. And I was like, look, I have no idea what this is, but I'm just going to send it to you because this is what's being said about me. And I'd rather you hear it from me then catch wind of this on social media and believe it to be true. And I I went and found one of the people that I suspected at the time to be involved in making this post. And uh, I went to their Facebook page and discovered that they had this big, long post about me. Um saying a bunch of stuff that wasn't true that I could confirm through other people and not just one person, multiple people that were at these places that they can confirm I never did any of these things. And even if I did do any of those things, right? Like, I was looking at you while I was playing... I misgendered you whenever I literally just met you. I mean, I don't I don't know. I don't I couldn't have done anything differently. Um and that's been my experience and that's a similar experience by the way of what I've noticed with other people just in my community, okay? And see, the problem is, is that over time, things get said over and over, and the story changes like a game of telephone. And it's it's very clear to me that this phenomenon within anything artistic is just here to stay because that instance for me ended up getting us dropped from a a quite a few shows like within the first couple weeks that it happened really um and then funny enough i booked a festival and I showed the owner of the bar that I was hosting this festival at hey this is what just so you know this is what's being said about me and they're like we don't care about this and then I started showing it to more venues before we started playing and they were like you know what we this is nothing But um, there's one venue here in Denton that still won't let us play. And that's fine. I mean, it's one venue. It's whatever. Um, And I think the irony of the whole thing is that they they don't know who I am. They don't know my experiences. Um... They don't know my friends even, people that I consider to be friends that, you know, don't adhere to 
a certain binary way of living. We'll just put it that way. Um, and that's never been a problem for me. Um, uh, now, I mean, I, I wrote an album that is very provocative and very emotional inducing. I mean, it induces a lot of emotions in people. And people make assumptions based off of the lyrical content, but I don't think that they see that it's a conceptual thing and that all the music that I do is conceptual. I, I, I take a very large concept and then I make every little song on the album relating to the big concept. And I do that with all of the albums. And, um, something that I think is also not recognized is that whenever instances like this happen, it actually devalues the real instances of assault and it devalues those voices that are finally coming up with the courage to say something and people try to argue and say that well people are just going to get caught in the crossfire and this is how it's going to be but that's not helpful for anybody it's not helpful for the people that actually go through something like that it's not helpful to the people that um would never do anything like that in their life but they're having people say this about them and it doesn't help the people that are just completely in the dark about what actually w w went on and then just see it on their social media feed because it's negative information that continues to warp the way that they see the world. And that starts to happen on a mass level, and it becomes a psychosis. I mean, it really does. You saw this with the Salem witch, tri witch trials, really. I mean, people were classifying any sort of behavior as witch behavior and, and poor innocent women were being hung because they were witches and it's, it's, it's like we've never learned anything from that time period I mean it really feels that way in so many different aspects and I think about what's happening on a global scale, you know, geopolitically right now, with some of the events happening in the Middle East and some of the events happening in Europe right now. And see, the problem is, is that nobody knows what really is the right thing to say anymore because it can change tomorrow. Because the powers that be that can say something in a news article, if it's from a certain company and it's funded by a certain group of people and it's printed with the intention of having some sort of morally virtuous position that you that you're enticed to take along with them then it it just increases this positive feedback loop that these that the people are allowing themselves to be a part of and you become complicit in whatever you know this large company's 
motive is to make you believe this thing. And, like, that's that's so difficult for me to wrap my head around because I thought the biggest complaint about modern society was that companies had too much money and that they had too much power. I mean, I thought that's what the whole problem was, right? Like, I thought that's what all of these punk songs were supposedly being written about or all of these, you know, pop-punk emo bands were complaining about whenever they were writing songs about injustice and, um, you know, disparity amongst, you know, the the working class. And it, and it's, it's just, there's this weird cognitive dissonance where... Um, oh yeah, that's, that's bad, and I'm better than you because I can recognize that's bad because this magazine or this news company made an article telling me that it's bad and confirmed everything I believe about it, um, and this company, uh, is funded by this other company that oh also has ties to the military industrial complex but you know that's but i'm good because i believe that i just i don't understand it um and people just dig their heels in to this i mean I mean, I I grew up being taught about all of the horrors of World War II and the Holocaust. And um, I mean, you're, you're, you're seeing things in society being played out on this level that, uh, it, it it doesn't it doesn't interface well with what seems to actually be going on so this cancel culture outrage stuff is starting to get more and more warped and far fetched and end up at this place that doesn't even make sense from what this group of people that's been on this side have been advocating for for the last 20 years since 9-11. So, you know, and I was old enough to understand what 9-11 was and what it meant in terms of how it was going to start to change people's lives. And uh, cancel culture equals a culture of fear, just flat out. Um, It's a fear of personal connections. You're not supposed to be able to feel close to anybody because if you do feel close to anybody that's a sign that you're leaving yourself vulnerable to be canceled um it's a culture of non reciprocity not reciprocity i mean like it, it's not reciprocal meaning that like if you do something for someone or you have some kind of exchange with someone you are you're not encouraged for that you're not encouraged for that behavior if anything people try to avoid reciprocity 
within a culture like that because it can be used as a weapon, a moral virtue weapon against you. And I just don't see how any of those things can construct anything. And so, like, the world of music that I live in now is not at all what I grew up seeing. It's not at all what I grew up understanding how the world was supposed to be like. It's not at all what I understood the people that I would be encountering within music were supposed to be like. And all I've really been able to see is that there's a lot of children out there that are in adult bodies that can't seem to get rid of the tattletale streak on all of these relatively insignificant things. Now, there are some people that are doing some bad stuff, and those people that are actually doing those bad stuff and the people that are actually feeling confident in saying the things that are happening to them so that that bad stuff can stop, that's a separate conversation. Um, but we're too skeptical of each other. We're too fearful of each other. And I don't know where it leads. Uh, this is, this video is not an anecdote. Um, for a solution. This is not... That's not what this is. This is just an outline of what the problem is, where it sort of stems from. And the only thing I can draw a very clear line from point A to B about is that the perceived evil people of the society or the outcasted people of society are the ones being targeted and have been targeted throughout the duration of this concept of canceling. Robert Johnson was a black man living in America who was the societal boogeyman. He he drank. He played a guitar and didn't have a job and ran away from his essentially his slave owner and uh, was an outcast from society. Elvis Presley was a an outcast musician playing a music that people associated with the devil, that people associated with people like Robert Johnson that were outcasts, that were lesser than, and he was punished for it for a while until he found a way to profit from it. Um, it seems like that's, that same kind of thing is happening, but the line, the goalpost is always shifting, and there's not enough people that have the critical thinking skills or the... observational skills 
to draw the connections to the way that we're living now and, you know, how things were operated in the past and, uh, we're in this weird spot where our history is our biggest fault now. You know, like, that's a perspective, is it? Our history is our biggest fault. There's this, like, guilt-stricken motive behind everybody in the way that they act towards each other. And I don't think that that's... I don't think that's sustainable. Um, but that's where we're at right now. So, if there's anything I could do as an individual to help mitigate this kind of behavior and minimize it over a longer period of time, I guess it would be to just really think about what it is that you're upset about when it comes to somebody that's doing something and really ask yourself if this is something that anybody should be able to do with a with a, de- a degree of you know justifiable doubt in the situation um because it really just takes more or more people pointing out inconsistencies in people's logic to make things better as a whole. And uh, I don't know, maybe we just need to ban emo music. I really don't know. <laughs> uh, that was a joke, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but I just... Yeah. Those are the things I've noticed. Those are the things I've seen. This video is going to end here. Hopefully somebody takes something of value from this. I don't I have no idea. 